science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it, and eventually, if there's an enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. For newcomers and old timers alike, the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can we prevent illness, see the signs of disease before it's too late, and care for our birds through ill health? What light does behavioral science shed on their nature, needs, and hopes? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots, let them roam around about you and share a life with them? How much freedom do you give them? What happens if you form a bond of trust with them? Watch and see what understanding their true nature can do for you. Come with us on a journey as we do more than examine a parrot's world. We live in it. Make some popcorn and bring in a few wood blocks. Let everyone have something to chew and a comfortable place to perch. Cockatoot is a presentation of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. Hi, and welcome to Cockatoo 40, Cockatoos with Attitude. Behaviors Fantastic Four. Well, let me introduce the birds we have with us today. Down there making all the noise is Salamander. And then up on the big perch is Sugar. Babalu here in my lap. And he's got a little leaking problem, but I think he'll be okay. And this is Sea Salt, right Sea Salt Bird? That's the easel. Snowball. And Peaches. What you doing over there, Peach? What you doing? Got enough to play with, little girl? Hmm? You got enough to play with? You're looking around like you want a little piece of wood like that? What you want? So, today we're going to talk about... <coughs> Training and, and when I say training, it doesn't necessarily mean sitting someone on a perch and teaching them to do a trick. Uh, training involves basically any behavior that you shape uh, in any other organism. So, in order to to start shaping behaviors, to making behaviors change, we in in our first two episodes we talked about observation and. And then we went into a little bit of how you can just change the environment or move a bird here or there, do simple things to, to uh, redirect their behavior. But uh, in this one, we're going to talk a little bit about what behavior is. Yeah. A behavior is anything an organism does involving action and a response to stimulation. Okay, so here if I say... Hey Cecil the cock. Hey, what's the matter, Cecil? Are you okay, Cecil? What's going on today? You look a little out of it. What's going on? You okay? What's wrong, Cecil? What's wrong, Cecil? You okay? You all right? Hi, boy. Hi, boy. What's going on, big boy? There you go.
Now he got a little wired up there and I, in response to my petting him and talking to him, he calmed down. Didn't you see so? I'm going to try to intersperse little tricks as we're going along here. They're not really tricks, they're just they're, they're methods that you can use to, uh, to deal with certain situations. For one example, if I grab either his lower or his upper mandible, if you grab either one of them and hold on to it, you can't be bitten, okay? Uh, and if you do it in a soothing way while you're talking to them, they don't generally mind. Um, I'm not saying that about a new bird you're just approaching, but most birds you've been around for a while can get to a point where they don't have a problem with that. Snowball? Is that right, Snowball? Uh -huh. Can I grab your beak, Snowball? Can they grab it? Yeah, see. So, <clears throat> basically, whatever actions you see from a bird in order to respond to stimulus, there's always some kind of stimulus around in the environment. That's a behavior. So when you, you can't say something, we discussed this before, but you can't say a bird is happy or a bad uh -huh. bird is sad or a bird is mean or a bird is friendly. Those don't really mean anything. You can see a behavior. You can see him fluffing out his feathers. You can see him talking. Yes, I hear you talking. Yes, I do. Snowball. I, I know. I know. Yeah, you tell him all about it. Snowball. You tell him, okay? Yeah, you tell him. So, you've heard of reward training. Most people kind of you know, heard one way or another, they've heard a little bit about reward training. And basically with reward training, you are giving someone positive reinforcement. But most people don't know what positive reinforcement means. If you are enjoying our videos, we hope that you can find it in your heart to support our work. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to care for our flock of heartbroken and abused birds. Most of our birds came with feather destructive disorder. Even a basic exam with blood work costs $300. Medical emergencies cost us thousands a year. We are a nonprofit, and donations are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. We need your support. Birds deserve a happy and healthy life. Become our patron at www.patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary to support us on a per video basis or donate at our webpage today. In, in the field of, of applied behavior analysis, working with parrots, working with anything in applied behavior analysis, um, positive means adding something, okay? So offering a seed, a sunflower seed, offering a little piece of papaya, that's positive because you are adding something. That's all it means. Positive just means adding something. So, um, and then reinforcement means to, to, to strengthen a behavior. So, positive reinforcement, right? What does that mean? Because I don't know. I'm not sure what it means. So, positive reinforcement means adding something to strengthen a behavior. You're either maintaining a behavior or strengthening it, to be more specific. So, Often when you go to somebody who's teaching you how to train a dog, um, dog trainers especially will talk about you know, adding something to strengthen a behavior or to maintain a behavior. So if a dog, you, take, you, know, you tell the dog to lift up its paw you know, and shake and then you give it a treat. The treat is the positive part. The behavior of raising its foot, okay, that's what you're reinforcing. So positive reinforcement is simply adding something to either maintain a behavior or, or you know, increase it. So there's other kinds of things that we use too. We don't use them as frequently. 
There's also negative. Now, what does negative mean? You'll hear someone saying negative this or that. You know, negative reinforcement. Uh -huh. Negative reinforcement would mean taking something away. Negative just means to take away in our specific discipline of bird training, okay, or training in general. It means to take something away. If you wanted your bird to play with certain toys, new toys that you put in a cage, if you have a bird that tends to pick just a little bit, and you want them to play with the preening toys, but they're playing with the one toy in the cage that doesn't help with that. It's the one toy that they don't actually chew on, they're just grabbing it and moving it around or whatever. So you want them to focus on the other toys. One way to make that happen is to take that toy out. Now you are removing something to reinforce the behavior of playing with the other toys. It doesn't always work in that case, but that's the idea, okay? If it does work, then that is definitely negative reinforcement. You took something away and you strengthened or maintained another bit of behavior. In this case, you are increasing the behavior of playing with the other toys. So that's what it means, doesn't it? Come on over here, Snowball. What you doing? You skidding? You skidding along? Are you skidding along? What you doing, Snowball? Yeah? Yeah, is it true? Is it true? So, at, and one of the things too, while I'm going through these, think about where you might apply them. You know, there are circumstances where you can apply these particular principles and make your life easier. So, if, if you're just thinking about what can I give them to make them do something, okay, in other words, to either increase or maintain the behavior, what can I give them, then you're only thinking in one limited way. You can also think about, well, what can I take out of the cage to make this better? What can I take out of the environment that will increase the behavior? Okay, um, if they're always sitting in a box uh -huh. and, and they're not doing anything else, they're just digging around in the box, kind of like Salman on the floor over there. He's just tearing up paper on the floor. I know that's great for the audio. That's what he likes to do, though. So, you guys can shoot me if I leave him in the room, but it comes out really strong in the audio, too. Hey, mister, you having fun over there, Sal? Hey, Sal. Sal. Salamander. Mander bird. What you doing? What you doing? Sal. Okay, now we have, here's an example. You're all trying to listen to this, and old salamander over there is, he's, uh, uh -huh doing something. So we're going to switch to the next form there. Are four forms basically. And this is going to be positive punishment. Now you think, I'm not going to punish my bird. Well, just talking to him got him interested in coming over here. Come on over, Sal. I talked to you and you wanted to come over? Okay. Hey, be nice. Come on, Sal. Let's leave him alone. Come on, Sal. Come on. It's okay. Come on up. Come on. That was nice. You led us right into the next part. You did the segue for us. Yes, you did. Very good. Very good. Very good. We also have positive punishment and negative punishment. So what in the world would positive punishment be? Well, punishment in the discipline of behavior analysis means to, it doesn't mean to hurt somebody, it doesn't mean that. What punishment means is to reduce a behavior. So if you're punishing a behavior, that simply means reducing it or getting rid of it. So we do actually do positive punishment. We add something into an environment to slow, to stop the behavior. Now what I was going to do, which I'm not doing now, is I was just gonna take a toy or a piece of wood and I was gonna to toss it his way. I was going to add something into his situation which would get his attention and possibly change his behavior. Well, I kind of did that anyway. I spoke to him. And by talking to him, asking him what was going on, just, you know, vocalizing with him, he decided he'd rather be over here. 
So that was positive punishment. I spoke to him, I added something, okay? I didn't reward him for anything. Be nice down there. I didn't reward him for anything. What I did was actually added something, my voice, to get him to stop from playing with the papers. On the last episode, it was a little noisy. He played with them for quite a while, didn't you? You did. He likes to do that while he's watching a movie. A lot of the times, he'll play with the paper for maybe 10 minutes, and then he'll get up and watch the movie, and then we won't hear any more paper. But when we're doing these videos, he is focused on just finding something to do, right? Because it's just boring. I don't have a movie on. I can't watch Ghostbusters. Oh, I can't watch Ghostbusters or anything else I like. He's got quite a few, mostly action movies. Mostly, no. He does like musicals too. He likes um, Chorus Line. That nail's a little bit stuck in my finger there. Ouch. There you go, that's better. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. You didn't mean to. No, that nail's just, you're pressing in a little hard, that's all. It's okay. Yeah, but you got it right back in the same spot again. <laughs>
And actually, it may have been me not hearing the quieter sound of it in the beginning. He may have gotten louder and louder. And at some point, I just reinforced it by commenting that he was making a sound. Now I don't do that. If he starts making that loud sound, which I have from the beginning before I, we actually started the episode, I'll put it in here. Um, if he starts making that crying sound, I don't listen to him. I just turn, tune it out until he makes another sound I like, and then I immediately respond. So now we're down to less than five minutes of that horrible sound, the one that came from uh, Dumb and Dumber. I don't know how you learned that. Yes, I do, but well, the last of the behavior fantastic four. Now we're moving on to the last one, which is, hi, sweetie, it's all right, which is negative. Yeah which is negative punishment, which simply means to take something away, to reduce or extinguish a behavior, to reduce or get rid of a behavior, okay? So, if you take away a nest box so that they won't be just constantly digging in the box all the time, um, that's, that's negative punishment. You're trying to reduce a behavior and uh, it's, neg it's negative because you are taking something away. The <clears throat> so this can be quite useful. There are situations where you think, well, you run through them. Can I do positive reinforcement with this? Can I do negative reinforcement? Can I do positive punishment? Because there's a behavior I don't want. Is there something I can add to stop this behavior? Like with him, when he gets his beak open, because I got the cameras out, when he gets his beak open like that, if I talk to him and if I toss him in the air and I, would you not do that with him? Be nice. Be nice. They know what be nice means. I'm trying to get them to stop doing something. Um, and it's usually with another bird. So Bob understands be nice in that context. So when he's got his beak open like that, I will use any of the four techniques, but most normally what I will do is add something or take away something to reinforce another behavior. So I'll, I'll be trying to reinforce a behavior like, like bouncing up and down and flapping his wings or talking or sitting and hugging. I will be working that way. The one that's the most dangerous, and I say dangerous because it does work, okay, but it's not good because it doesn't make a bird want to continue to learn, or any other animal, for that matter. <coughs> People, too. Will you quit trying to bite his time hind end? Don't bite his tail. And if you didn't always sit in Bob's spot, he wouldn't have a problem with you. Yeah, you and your big open beak every time I got the cameras out. Yeah, I know you. You're being silly. Um, positive punishment. That's a good example of positive punishment. Dog pees on the floor, take a newspaper and hit the dog. I would never do that. Um, because what the, the problem with that positive punishment is that it actually is positively reinforcing. What it does is it reinforces you to continue doing it. Because it works. If you go over to a dog that's just peed on the floor and you hit them, they're going to go cower and run away. Okay? So um, if you have a bird, let's say if Bob was getting into something and I ran over and, and uh, you know, positive, I add something. So I run over and I take my hand and I whack him with my hand, right, to get out of something. He'll move. He'll do that. But he may not want to, you know, he'll stop wanting to learn. One of the big problems with positive punishment is that an animal will respond to it. I mean, if I come at you with a hot poker, you know, and say, get out of your car, or I point a gun at you and say, get out of your car, I'm adding a gun in your face, the threat of death. If you don't get out of your car, you're going to get out. But I doubt the next time that you see me, you're going to be like, hey, can we do that again? <laughs> right? <laughs> 
So anytime like <laughs> you're adding, hey salamander, what you doing, Sal? Sal, what's going on? Hi salamander, ah. mander mander salamander bird. What you doing, mander? Mander bird. Sorry, we should have it. Hey mander. Mander bird. What you doing? What you doing? You gonna hit the papers again? Are you? Okay. Let's see if I can get, see if I can get him to stop. I don't know what I've got. Let's toss this towards him. We're gonna add this little toy to try to reduce his behavior. Okay. Okay. He's over there playing with the paper. See if I can get it over there. Well, I didn't mean to scare you. Well, I didn't mean to scare you. That was totally unexpected. He's never reacted that way before. Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. Okay. That was unintentional. Sorry. I'm sorry. I am. Well, come over here, I'll play you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that's the problem. No, we're not going to mate today, sweetie. Oh, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you all right? You okay? You got a little bit of going there, kid. You all right? Mand, are you okay? Now, I was trying... That's a good example of how positive punishment can go wrong. I was trying to stop a behavior and I tossed something over on the paper. Just to add something into the environment just, just to break his concentration. Well, it just landed in the center of the paper and it made a noise. And I've never seen him do that before, but when it made the noise, it scared him and he ran away. Okay. Uh, that was not my intent. I like him to be on the planet. Now I'll have to work with him to make sure he enjoys that area. Hey, Sal, it's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. I didn't mean to. But that does show you how positive punishment can definitely work. That the sound of that landing in the paper. The sound of that was positive and it punished the behavior as in he stopped doing the behavior. But as you can also see in this situation, he's not a happy bird. Okay. Are you? I'm sorry. You go play with the paper if you want to. It's okay. I know. I know that was really scary. I know. I didn't, I didn't mean to scare you. I just meant to throw something over there to kind of break your attention just a little, add a little something to slow the behavior. That's another thing with, with positive punishment, you don't know what's going to be going too far. So you want to avoid that. So the better way, of course, without the cameras and all that stuff is to walk over, talk to him, put your hand down and reward him with a social behavior or offer him this one. You just have to offer him an unsalted chip or just part of an unsalted chip or something and he's out of there that positive reward will work much better and he won't be sitting on top of a perch freaking out he's okay now but the mere fact that something landed in that area that was noisy was too much for him so are you okay are you all right meander meander salamander Okay, he just rusts, so he's okay. Now I know. Hello. Hello, sweetheart. You're a good boy. But you taught a good lesson. So, as you can see, using... <laughs> Bob, you love to do that to me. As you can see, using you know, positive punishment can 
you're never sure exactly how far it's going to go, what effects it's going to have. And in this case, that was meant to be just a mild deterrent, and it went just the other way. He still hasn't gone back down there. So the reason I say it's positively reinforcing is because somebody will go, hey, if I throw something over onto the paper, he'll stop making that noise. And they'll start doing it regularly. That's the only time you're ever going to see me do that. I didn't expect it to go that far, and I was just trying to put a tiny bit in. But what it does is that people say, hey, I saw that worked. I'll just do that next time. No, you don't want to. Because it does not encourage, in this case, it's not encouraging him to play in his favorite area. So I'll have to do that when the video is over. I'll get down with him and we'll play a little bit together down there. And he'll be fine with it again. I'll show him what I threw. Discuss it. You know, he doesn't understand English, but I'll act like he's understanding it. I'll show him this is what I threw. And we'll get down there and I'll let him chew the paper and he'll be fine. But you see the danger of it. And the other danger is, you know, you go, hey, that works, man. I'll just do that next time. No, you don't want to do positive punishment. So positive reinforcement, on the other hand, if I'd reached it in my pocket, pulled out a chip that he likes. Actually, he prefers the salted ones because that's what they used to give him, but I won't do it. The salt's really not good for them at all. So, I mean, they get a little bit. Everything has a little bit of salt in it, but, I mean, not what we use, which is like ladle the salt on. You know, humans just eat far too much of that stuff. So... If I had pulled out something he liked to eat, he'd have been right over. Or if he knows that I'm going to just sit and hold him and pet, pet him, and if I can get that across to him, that's what I want him over here, he'll come right over because he loves the social interaction. But when there's other birds around, he tends to step away from them, turn his head like this, like he's looking for a place to go, to walk away a little bit. This is the kind of behavior you see around him. It's not that he doesn't like being around other birds. It's that he turns his head and he walks away. Or he positions himself like he's going to get out of there. Are you going to hit me with that? Are you going to hit me with it? Are you going to hit me with it? Yar, okay. I thought you were. Does it feel good to hit me with it? <laughs> You're silly. You're a big silly bird. You are. You're so cute. He's such a good bird. He has had the term good bird bonded with positive experiences, okay? So we call that a secondary reinforcer. So with them, primary reinforcers are like food they like, okay? Um, there's other primary reinforcers though. There's things like heat. When you're cold, somebody gives you heat. That's, you know, natural reinforcer. It's an unconditioned response, which means that nobody had to teach you that when you're cold and you add warmth, you know, like some, I can get by the fireplace when it's cold. I used to, that's a good story too. When I was a kid, my uh, grandmother and grandfather had a house up in the high desert in the San Diego County up in a place called Tierra del Sol. And my grandmother did not believe, she just didn't believe in having the windows closed, okay? The windows were always open. So we'd be up there around Christmas time and you know, the high desert, even in San Diego County, it gets cold, okay? It freezes. So we'd be sleeping under like a mountain of, of blankets. I mean, there's one sheet and 600 blankets. Well, it wasn't quite that many, but you get the idea. So so here we kids would, we would we'd just dash, we'd run as fast as we could, jump out of the bed, all, always dressed. We always had clothes on under the bed. So we jump out, run into the living room, because we could hear the fire crackling, and we'd go by the fire and put our hands up to the fire and everything. So that's a primary reinforcer. You will naturally feel you know, positive if you're freezing and somebody offers you warmth. Um, just another story I read, and I don't know if it's true, but um, in a book on Eskimos, they were talking about how the missionaries had gone and told them about hell. You know, if you if you do this and this and this, you you know you don't you don't accept our religion, you're going to hell. And they described what hell was like, and the Eskimos wanted to go there. You mean a place that's always warm? Oh yeah, we're going. Let's pack up. So so those are unconditioned. But when you when we talk about secondary reinforcer, all that really is is something that is it's usually connected with it. Um, um, 
it is something that's connected with a positive experience. So if I give him a treat he likes, okay, and I say, good bird, oh, now, now, and I say, good bird, you, you know, you do this every time I have these cameras up, you've got people thinking you're just a vicious bird. Yes, you do, because that's all they've ever seen is you opening that beak towards me. That's all, well, we have some little videos that I've, I've taken a few videos of him when there wasn't all this camera apparatus around. You can see how he doesn't normally like this, but you aren't normally like this. No, you aren't. The thing about secondary, primary reinforcers work, okay? But once you are got out of that bed and you run into the fireplace and you sit there and you finally get warm, if, some, if somebody were to say, hey, there's a warm spot over here, you don't care. So the primary reinforcer loses its effect. If I feed him a little piece of papaya, then a little piece of papaya, then a little piece of papaya, till he finally gets full, then the papaya doesn't work anymore. But good boy can work all the time, or good bird can work all the time. Because it's associated with the feeling of getting that initial reinforcer, which we call, which you usually hear called a reward. Um, that's really not the good name. It's a good name for it. And that's why specifically in behavior science, it's called a reinforcer. Because it's, re it re it's used to reinforce particular behaviors. As in strengthen them or maintain them. But good bird will work forever. It will work today, tomorrow. It will work for hours at a time. Um, it's not as strong. If I say, if I'm talking to him and petting him and saying, good bird, he responds to it. But if he sees a potato chip, an unsalted potato chip, he's on it. I mean, that's the whole focus of it. Unless, of course, he's full. And he does get full, don't you? So, um, so basically there's four. Again, we'll go over it. There's four. There's the, and, and it's just simple. We'll go over the first terms first. Go over the basic terms. Behavior. That's an act, that's any action in response to a stimulus by an organism. So whatever the stimulus is, if it's my finger in front of his face, which of course now, oh there you go. See, there was a response to a stimulus, an obvious response. Um, which most people would be horrified to see a bird go ah, with a beak like that, but um so that's a behavior. Then you have positive and negative. Hey, it couldn't be any more. Di it couldn't be any easier. Add something positive. Take something away negative. It's not like you have to be a rocket scientist to remember that. Adding or subtracting, positive or negative. That's it. And then you have reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement means to either increase or maintain a behavior, and are you falling asleep? Am I boring you? If I'm boring you, we're in trouble. If I'm boring the snowball, come here snowball, am I boring the snowball? Am I boring you? Hmm? Am I snowball? 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 No ball. He's just just down there chewing on wood. So reinforcement is just maintaining or increasing a behavior, and punishment is just just you know reducing a behavior or extinguishing it. <laughs> extinguishing a behavior means to get rid of it. Now one of the things to rem to remember, and it's something that I was taught in my classes on applied behavior analysis, uh, the LLA course at behaviorworks.org from Dr. Friedman, is that if you if you reduce a behavior, okay, you've got this behavior punished to the point where it no longer exists. We call that an extinguished behavior. There will be a thing, we're going to use another big term, called resurgence. What does that really mean? It just means it's going to come back. In most cases, that behavior will return. If you already know that, 
when it happens, you don't go, oh, I worked so hard to get him to stop screaming. I worked so hard to get him to stop biting. I worked so hard to get him to stop chasing me when I'm wearing my shoes. Generally, the same techniques you used, whatever method you used, uh, positive reinforcement or whatever, whatever you used that got rid of the behavior before, we'll do it again. So you can, and it will take little time to do it. It'll usually be, if it took you, for example, we'll use, if it took you 10 days to train them not to do it before, it might be one or two. You'll see a few times of resurgence and then maybe, maybe a year or two later, it might come back again. It'll go away just the same. Don't panic, okay? Just don't panic when that happens. Um, that's normal. Uh, resurgence is something that we see all the time. And the thing is, don't become disheartened when it does happen. Um, you may even see it while you're training a behavior down, while you're punishing a behavior. You may see that behavior get weaker and weaker and weaker and just be sitting on the edge and then come back with a vengeance. No problem. It'll go down fast the next time. There may be exceptions, but I haven't seen one. Honestly. He used to be a screamer. Once in a while he starts it up. Um, usually within a day or two I've got that gone. Um, he's almost done with his... Uh, Dumb and Dumber sounds, that, that uh, the worst sound in the world. He's almost done with that. And it comes back at times. I just treat it the same way. Same thing. I ignore it. And he's going to make it. One thing about him is that he'll do it for a little while, and then he'll try something else. There is something, another principle of behavior that is key to everything you're ever going to train. Okay? All training is <clears throat> something called the extinction burst. Now we talked about extinction, that means to get rid of something. So an extinction burst is when you're, let's say you're training them to wave, okay? So you've got to know where they can move their foot up a little bit, they move their foot up a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you keep trying to train it, and they just keep moving their foot up a little bit, moving their foot up a little bit, and that's it. You can't get them to do anything else, right? Mm -hmm. But they do it, and you can reward it. What you do is you get to this one point, and you stop rewarding it. You just don't give them. Even though they did it, you don't give them anything. And when that happens, and you think, why would you do that? Well, it's like when you go to the Coke machine, right? <laughs> You're up at the Coke machine, you put your money in, and you press the button. I'm going to get the Dr. Pepper. And you press it. You hear clunk, but nothing comes out. The money went in, nothing comes out. So, of course, what we all do is just walk away. It didn't work, right? No, nobody does that. What we do is go, we hit the return, change return, nothing happens. We look up under there, I don't see, the. there's no Coke can here. Then, what most people do is this. Is there anybody looking? Okay. Is there anybody looking? Oh, nobody's looking. Okay. Shake the Coke machine a little bit. Push against it. Bang might even find yourself kicking it if you're in a really remote place and you know nobody's going to see you. You might just start kicking it. These are extinction bursts because you normally, you do this, you put the money in, and you expect your reward. That Coke or that Dr. Pepper or that Sprite doesn't come out, okay? doesn't come out. You didn't get your reward, so now you're going to do all kinds of different things. That's where we capture behavior because... <laughs> You know, they're used to going like this and getting a treat, and then it doesn't happen, and then they're like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, what do you want me to do? I'm doing it, I'm doing it! Bingo! Give them the treat right there. As soon as you <laughs> see that hand waving, often you'll go from that to that, but it may only be from here to, like, they've got their foot here, they get it up a little higher to there, and you reward it. Until finally you get it to where their, their foot's up here, and then they'll put it up and it'll start going like this. So you wait till they get it up there, okay? Then you don't give them the reward, so they start moving it around. When they do this, maybe they only bring it down once. Reward that. So now you've got it going from here to here, reward. So they go up and do this. 
and then you don't reward it. And after a while, you're eventually rewarding this behavior and you've got it. Now you've captured that behavior. You can't talk to them in English. There's no way. They know a few words, but, and I've had people tell me they think their birds understand their, their language. It's not true. They understand our body language better than what we say. They do understand certain words. They, in context, they know what they mean. But not the way we think of them, but they know what they mean in their world according to the behaviors they see us do. So that extinction burst, okay, that, that moment of, I should be getting that Coke out of the can. You know, I should, I should be, the Coke should have come in. I put the money in there. That's how you get them to do different behaviors. Once you've taught them something, they go up, and then after a while it gets easier, okay, as you're teaching them. You were agreeing with me, Bob? Did you agree with me? Did you agree, Bob? Did you? Did you really agree with me? Yeah, I know he's ah. in your spot. I know. There he goes. Don't fight. And why do you have to take over Bob's spot? Oh, you're such a love bug. You don't get people thinking you're not a love bug because you are. You're a good bird. You're a good bird. So whenever you're training anything, if you're using positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, you're using positive punishment, negative punishment, and whatever you're using, okay, and this is especially true of the positive reinforcement though, you, you're waiting for an extinction burst if you're trying to teach a more complex behavior, okay? You're not getting the reward. You, you get them to a certain point. They're not getting the reward they expect. So they start doing crazy stuff, trying to get it, and that's where you capture the next step. Don't try to push it to the ultimate. If you're trying to teach a bird to, to play, to, to run over and drop a basketball into a little basketball hoop, you know, a little miniature basketball, don't expect them to, like, you know, you've got them to finally pick up the ball. Don't expect them to run over and drop the ball in the basket. If it happens, reward it and flood it with the rewards, where normally if you gave them one little piece of papaya, give them one, give them another, give them another, give them like five, because they did the whole behavior all the way across, dropped it in. Sometimes, you may, you may laugh, but sometimes it's that easy. Sometimes they get the idea and they go. They're smart. If they can figure out what you want, they'll do it to get that reward. And there's more reward to it than just the treat. Don't think that the reward Okay, in this case, it's the reinforcers, that little reward. Don't think that's all there is to it. They like the social contact. These are social animals. They want the social contact. So that's part of why they do it. And I know I've said this before. I've trained birds and put the treats down below the tray, and they won't go down and get them. They'll do the behavior. They'll work with me on the behavior. Because that's more fun than going down and just <laughs> eating the food that's in the bowl. They enjoy social interaction. So basically, a uh, well, quick summary at the end, you have, you should know what behavior is. It's any action, in our case, behavior is any action a bird does in response to a stimulus. Okay. And all of our actions are in response to some stimulus. You have... You have the behavior fantastic four. Very nice, uh -huh. Chub Chub Bird. Oh, Chub Chub Bird. What you doing up there? Uh -huh. One of these days you uh -huh. should come down and see us down here while we're doing the video. Uh -huh. You know that? Hi, Snowball. Hello, Sal. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Note that Sal's still up there. He's not down playing there. Uh -huh. So a lot of people uh -huh. would indeed say, hey, the positive punishment works, so I'm uh -huh. going to do it again. Don't. Don't. I'm going to have to work uh -huh. with him to get him to play in his normal area uh -huh. because he's nervous. That sound just spooked him. Uh -huh. Unintentional. Didn't mean to do that. Uh -huh. we, we do unintentional uh -huh. ones like that, that positive punishment. We do that without even realizing. Um, uh -huh. And I was actually aiming where he could see uh -huh. the toy and, you know, my aim sucks. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, it really does. Uh -huh. I did not play basketball. When I was in school, no, I did not, did I, Cecil? Cecil says, no, you did not. You did not. You did not. Uh -huh. Oh, you're being silly. Uh -huh. 
I don't know. You're just being silly. You're being silly. Snowball. Snowball. So positive punishment. Let's see. Positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement. Positive punishment. And negative punishment. Don't forget the extinction burst. Okay. That's something uh -huh. to keep track of. And remember that extinction burst. That's critical uh, when you're training. And that extinguishing by itself doesn't work. You need to pair it with something else. So if you pair it with any other behavior, anything else, you hear them make one sound, you don't want them to squawk, you have a certain sound you don't want them to make, you ignore it as soon as they make, if they make lots of sounds, pick another sound, any other sound, and acknowledge that. After a while, they won't make the sound because it isn't getting a response. Just like after a while, if that Coke machine doesn't give you any Cokes, you aren't going back to it. So, isn't that right, Cecil? Well, come on, tell me. Dude, it's being so strange today. Cecil the bird! Cecil the bird! Boy, you are just all fired up today. What's going on? Get rid of the cameras, Dad. I know. Get rid of the cameras. He's Cecil the cockatoo. He's Cecil the cockatoo. He's strong to the finish cause he eats his spinach. He's Cecil the cockatoo. He's Cecil the cockatoo. Hello. He's Cecil the cockatoo. Hello. He's strong to the finish cause he eats his spinach. He's Cecil the cockatoo. Yes, yeah, Cecil. Cecil bird. <laughs> Cecil bird. Cecil the bird! Cecil, Cecil, Cecil bird! Cecil, Cecil, Cecil bird! Cecil bird! Cecil bird! Bird, bird! Good boy, Cecil. That's a good bird. Okay, Cecil, say goodbye to all our friends. <laughs> we'll see you next time. This has been Cockatude 40. Behavior is Fantastic 4. And I'm Don Scott with the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos. Please check out our website. Check out our YouTube channel. The whole channel is a lot of stuff out there. A lot of different things. And we'll see you next time. We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. So science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.